Perspective on Florida Gateway College Television is sponsored by Nutrien. Nutrien, feeding the future. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Perspective. This is a public affairs presentation of Florida Gateway College. My name is Mike McKee, and my guest on the program is Travis George. He is the Associate Director of Financial Aid here at Florida Gateway College, and we're going to talk about how you go about applying for financial aid and or scholarship money. There's really no reason why you can't go to school because of money. We'll do that when we come back. Don't go away. What we have to offer students as far as technology and equipment, there isn't another school in our area that has as much to offer our students um, that we do with virtual reality welders, real weld trainers, robotic welding education cell, and also having the advanced process welders that we have. I just know that we have a great program here at Florida Gateway and it's continuing to grow. We're getting more and more new technologies and I'm really excited to learn how to use all of them. Welcome back to Perspective here on Florida Gateway College Television. Travis George is the Associate Director of Financial Aid here at the college. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I guess the, the, the people consider money an obstacle to go into school, uh, and we're here today to dispel that rumor. Um, it, it really is not true that there, there is money available for any student that qualifies to go to school. Yes, sir, that is correct. Um, typically, our students who are, especially our serious students, we have a ton of scholarship money. Um, we have a, a wonderful staff person who works in our office. She's really good about giving out scholarships. The only, um, the deal with scholarships, though, is students have to maintain at least a 2.5 GPA. So that's why I say serious students. I mean, if a student is really serious, uh, we have scholarship money that's available to them. Now, the, the student doesn't have to go and find that money. They, the person in the office can find the, the, the right money that fits Correct. Uh, the way it's done now is we have one scholarship application that is given for all students. Even students who are graduating seniors can apply online through the FGC page. They'll apply for scholarships there. Uh, from there, uh, the person in our office who handles scholarships, Melinda, she'll look at each applicant, see every scholarship that they qualify for, what's the requirements, and then she's able to award them based off of several criteria. Uh, their GPA, number of credit hours, uh, majors, and so we have some that are just that are specified just for specific majors that nobody outside of a major can get it, and so that's why yeah, we have a ton of scholarship, great donors. Well, Travis, when if you're a student in high school and say you're a junior or or you're you're starting your senior year, when is the best time to get plans in place for financial aid? We actually have a, what's called a FAFSA checklist which actually starts for students who are actually in kindergarten. And there's a side for the students to do, and there's also a side for the parents to do. And so what, what it does is, through, once they go through each one, they're checking it off at each grade level. Uh, we have those booklets actually in our office for anyone that wants to print them out. Now, you say kindergarten. Yes, sir. What, and you know, <laughs> I mean, how, what, what, what types of things are they talking about in, in kindergarten? What, I mean, you're, you're talking what? Eight? Yeah or what is it, 14 years? About 14 years, yes sir. Uh, typically for anyone who's in kindergarten, it's real fun things that they can start doing now. It's more interactive, it's more like a game type deal that we're asking them to, to look into. Uh, it's only like two things they can do starting in kindergarten and as they continue to grow, the responsibility of things that continue to go on are, becomes more, more uh, inclusive and more, uh, uh, I guess a lot more things are added to that list to be checked off. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the different types of financial aid. The, mm -hmm. what, what, type, what, what are different types that are available through your office? Okay, so there are actually four parts of financial aid um, that we have. First is grants, then it is the uh, scholarships, of course, the federal work study, and then the last is loans. Um, the, the grants, which include our federal Pell Grant, the um, SCOG, which is the uh, Education Opportunity Grant, the student uh, assistance grant, uh, those are all free money. 
um, money you, you don't, don't, you have, don't to, have to pay back. You don't have to pay it back. Um, there are some there are some instances where that money does have to be paid back, but that's only if students are not meeting academic progress. So we want to make sure that students are meeting academic progress. Well, and you want them to be successful with the money that they're they're getting for. Correct. Yes, sir. Of course. Uh, the other one is scholarships. There are several scholarships that are available to students that are um, done. Some are done through the state of Florida, and they're the ones that we have here. Uh, seniors who are graduating can do their uh, their Bright Futures application, which allows them to get scholarship based upon uh, GPA requirements and testing on either ACT, SAT, uh, or a combination of the, the three, ACT, SAT. Um, and then there's also the Federal Work Studies Program, which allows students to actually come to school. They'll come into school, they can work in a department, and um, they're allowed to, the, we, the departments know to work with them with their schedule, so they, they have to go to class and understand that. Um, the last one is loans, which we don't really encourage students to take out, especially not here, because tuition is so uh, low. Now, we were ranked, I think, 38th of the most affordable colleges in this country. And so, um, well, and we haven't raised tuition in five years. So, wow, right. the, the tuition has held the line, and universities uh, have have raised tuition. Uh, so it, it's a bargain. Uh, and so the Pell, let's talk about the the Pell grants. Uh, okay. What what are the qualifications? What do you have to to provide to uh, your office in order to be qualified for Pell? Okay, good question. So a student who, um, first they'd have to do is create an FSAID. So they would go to the uh, fsaid.ed.gov webpage. They'll create that student aid uh, ID. Um, uh, when they first started the electronic system, that was created with a PIN number. So the FSAID has taken over the PIN. Once they create an FSAID, then they'll go and actually fill out a FAFSA application, which is a free application for federal student aid. Once they actually submit the FAFSA application, uh, we'll get, once they complete it, we'll actually get what's called an EFC number. That number uh, is called an expected family contribution. When they first started that, it was a number in dollar amounts that was saying this is what we actually expect families to contribute to education for a student. Uh, so it's as low as zero and it can go extremely high. Based on where that number falls in, that tells us what students qualify for. Uh, in, in the federal Pell Grant. Right now, the most that they can qualify for is about $5,920 for an entire year. And even if you look at a student who's full-time here, they're looking anywhere at, at between $1,400. So they're looking at maybe about $3,000 for an entire year. So they're, they're looking at refunds just based off having a Pell Grant alone. Most of them, unless you know they're out of state or there's some extra fees that are, are charged to their account. So the, the extra money from that uh, Pell Grant can be used for well, uh, typically first it comes to us first and right. we apply it to their tuition and fees and books. Uh, whatever's left over is given to the student in the form of a refund, normally 30 to 45 days from the start of class. Um, they're supposed to use the rest of that refund for educational expenses. Well, that, and that could be transportation, transportation. it can be for child care, it yes. can be for all kinds of different uh, things as it relates to being successful in school. Correct. correct. Yes, sir. Now, yes, sir. you know, this, I, I don't can you pay a tutor if you're if you're having is that part of the you, expense? You could, but the good thing is through the Trio grant, we actually have tutors who are here uh, on campus that work for free, and now they have Saturday hours from ten to two. So for someone who's working during the week who can't come out here during regular hours, they can actually come in on Saturday mornings anytime from ten to two o'clock in the afternoon. It's completely free. All they have to do is just sign in, and their tutors there for just about every subject area. Let me ask you about, we've talked about uh, students that are in high school that are coming to school here in the following semester. What about non-traditional students? Uh, are they eligible? For, you know, someone who's been working or maybe they were laid off uh, and they want to do something, a different type of career, is Pell available to them as well? Yes, Pell is available to those students as well. Uh, the one thing that we're finding with our non-traditional students are students who possibly started school a, a while ago and then they decided to drop out. Uh, with the new federal regulations with satisfactory academic progress, that's where this becomes a problem. Now for a non-traditional student um, who is just now starting, they won't have any issues. It'll, kinda, it'll be similar to a student who's fresh out of high school. But for students who've started college before and is coming back into school, 
the federal government does look at those credit hours in terms of academic progress to help us maintain and get an understanding of where they are with their completion rate, which has to stay at a 67 percent, their GPA, which has to be at least a 2.0, and if they're going max 150, which means they've exceeded 150 percent of just a program of study. Now, is there a difference between uh, Pell Grants for, like, a, a, we had a welding commercial that, that students can, that's, that's not as expensive and not as long as a two-year degree. Correct. Uh, what's, what's the differences in that? So, uh, depending on which program a student goes into, that determines, it doesn't necessarily change the amount of pay that they're eligible to receive. A student who has a zero, zero EFC is eligible for up to $5,920, regardless of the program of study. Um, the only thing that really changes is clock hours has, the, the amount that a student can be awarded in clock hours is prorated based on the number of hours that they're actually taking. And so that one gets a little bit tricky. Uh, that is, it, it's, uh, that's a little bit trickier, but a student who's in full time can possibly get that full amount regardless of the program of study. Uh, is this something that happens every year? I mean, do you have to uh, reapply yes. every year? I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, even for seniors, a senior who is in high school, uh, let's say a student starts high school in August, the application, if they're gonna graduate in May, they actually can start the application for the financial aid October of that year that they're in their senior in high school. So let's say, for example, uh, someone who's a senior starting in August, so they'll graduate in the, the May of 2019. So a student 2018 is a senior, class of 2019, they actually start their FAFSA application October of this year, even though they're gonna be going to school in August of 2019. <clears throat> okay, and so it, the earlier the better. I mean, you know, yes. in, in this day and age, young people like to procrastinate. And yes. the, uh, is, is it easier? I mean, do you, would you be less stressed out about your money if you did it early? Yes, I'm, and I'm glad you asked that question, too. Um, a lot of students who do their FAFSA applications later, uh, we find those students are selected for verification a whole lot more as opposed to students who complete their applications earlier. Uh, verification is a process where you have to produce documents to verify the information that you put on your FAFSA applications. Now, there is a catalyst that, is, that most students have to go through as well. Uh, it looks at, you know, if something is off in the FAFSA application, like for example, if a parent lists that they are married but they file head of household or they're married filing separate, that flags it when it goes to the Department of Education, so they ask us to, to the students to provide the documentation. Um, but it is so much better to get it done earlier, so that way if you have to turn in documentation, you know earlier before you start school, so that way that's the last thing that you have to worry about trying to turn in uh, is the documentation to verify your FAFSA. Now you went, uh, you mentioned FAFSA. What does FAFSA stand for? Very good, so yes, uh, so free application for federal student aid, which is, is very important to remember that because the first word does mean free. I've had a lot of students come into the office and they say that they've actually paid to have their FAFSA's completed. So it, it means free. So make sure that no one is paying for a service that is free. And if they ever need help, they can always come to our office. Even if they don't plan on coming to Florida Gateway College, they can still come. We'll love to help them get their FAFSA applications done. So Travis, we know what FAFSA is. Let's take a look at a little video on FAFSA. Very good. Yes, I think we have a clip. If you have any questions about what information to gather, there is a complete list of documents that you will need at FAFSA.gov. Before you begin the process of filling out the FAFSA, you should create a username and password called an FSA ID that will act as your electronic signature. You'll only need to create an FSA ID once, and you can use it to renew your FAFSA each year that you apply. Your parents will need an FSA ID too if they have to provide any information. So now you're ready to begin filling out the FAFSA to apply for financial aid. There are three groups of questions that include personal information, such as your name, address, and marital status, financial information, such as your income, and any parent information that is required. If you get hung up or confused about a question, the Help and Hints box on the right-hand side of the application can help with each question as you move along. Also, look for the online chat feature under Help if you would like assistance from a knowledgeable agent. Because colleges and career schools use the FAFSA to provide financial aid, you can list up to 10 schools that you are interested in attending. You should list all of the schools that you are considering, even if you haven't been accepted or applied yet. 
If you have more than 10 schools in mind, you can submit your FAFSA with 10 schools and then replace some of those schools with other schools later. When you finish filling out the FAFSA, use your FSA ID to sign the form. If you are required to submit parent information on your FAFSA, a parent will need to sign the application with his or her own FSA ID as well. If you have any questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Okay, so pretty simple. What is the biggest hang-up in filling out your FAFSA online? Is it not having the documentation or is there some other thing that some people get hung up on? I think, uh, well, several things. Um, the biggest hang-up is probably having the documentation. Um, the IRS has worked with the Department of Education to be sure that they can link to the IRS webpage so it's able to pull in a lot of tax documents automatically from the IRS. And sometimes that, that function doesn't work for certain students or certain parents. You know, if you're a victim of identity theft or uh, your, your taxes were stolen or someone tried to file taxes fraudulently under you, you can't use this tool. So being sure that you have the actual taxes from two years prior, make sure you have that document so you can fill it in correctly. So uh, we're coming up on 1819, so that actually looks at taxes that you filed in 2016. And then when we go into the, the 1920 uh, age year, that'll be looking at taxes uh, from, um, uh, when we go into 1920, uh, we'll be looking at taxes from 2017. So being sure that those tax documents are available and on hand so you can fill in correctly. That's typically the only one of the hangups we fall into the fast, but the only other one is students and parents not remembering their login and password. Uh, simple fixes, but, uh, I'm sorry, a simple fix, but we do run into the hang up of um, students or parents forgetting what that password is. They've gotten it now to where they can actually, if you forgot your password, they can link it to your email address or a cell phone, but um, if you forgot it and you don't remember what email address you used or your, your cell phone changes, then they take you through the steps of security questions. And those security questions uh, are cap lock specific. And even if you get the security questions correct, you're locked out for about 30 minutes. So then you have to come back in and try to log in again. And if you've got your password again, you're going through the steps again. And that's, that's the biggest hang up is people remembering. What would you say <coughs> the percentage of students uh, that are on some Pell? Is, no. it, is it a good, good uh, number? I mean, are we talking over 50%? I, yes, sir. I, if I make no mistake, I think the last time we checked, I think it was about 80 percent. And I could be mistaken, but I know it was more than 50. It was more than 50. So um, there's a lot. If you if you consider there are 5,000 students at Florida Gateway College and, and 80 or, or even a number close to 80 are all doing FAFSA, FAFSA. Yes, or sir. they're all applying, you don't want to be that 4,999 4, that gets approved, I mean, so right. get it done. Of course, and even our scholarships that are done through our foundation, we require that students have a FAFSA application on file. They now, don't, and, and that's just so that, that you're in the system, correct? In the system, and we want to make sure students are aware because they may qualify for some additional aid that they're just not aware of. Some students say, well, my parents make too much money, so I don't qualify for aid. What we're doing is we're also showing our donors that our students are taking responsible steps to ensuring that they are doing well and as far as their finances are. And it also, um, we can't award students more than what's called a budget. And, and basically that's the other reason why we do require the FAFSA to be done is because if we start going over a student's budget, then that money has to be sent back. And so that's why we make sure that they have a FAFSA on file. Okay. Um, so the <coughs> earlier you can get uh, your paperwork in order, the better. Uh, you. In addition to what you're doing here today and reaching uh, folks on uh, local cable and, and on our YouTube page, you guys take your financial aid, you go on a road, you have a road show, right? Talk about <laughs> where, where you go, you go to each of the five counties that are served by Florida Gateway College and you have a day where you, you're like, anything you want to know about financial aid, we're there to answer that question, right? Yes, sir, we do. Um, we actually have a outreach coordinator who actually goes out to the five area high schools and we do that once a month, once a month, to at least three high schools: uh, Fort White, Columbia, and Becker County. We're there helping students get their FSA IDs created, and if they bring their parents, we help them do their FAFSA applications. Um, we also go to Union County, um, Bell High School, Trenton, 
and Cross City to help them as well get their, their financial aid applications. We're not there once a month in those other, the last four, but we do go visit them just to make sure that they got their FAFSA applications done. Uh, it's a free service, and so we want to make sure that the students who are in these counties are being serviced well and that they understand that we're here to help. Uh, even if they're not thinking about coming to Florida Gateway College, we're still there to make sure that they understand that we want to provide as much as we can to help them. Well, and, and sometimes students in, in crowds don't like to, to ask questions in front of their peers. <laughs> of so you, you, at that point, you can get some one-on-one -on -one time with, with your outreach person, uh, maybe in an, an appointment where they're away from other people. If they, have this, they think maybe their question is silly. Yes, sir, definitely. And, and we do. We find a lot of students who are um, apprehensive about asking questions in, in large crowds. And so once presentations are done, a lot of students will come up and a lot of times they have questions about things that are private. Uh, you know, students who are homeless qualify for free tuition and they also qualify to possibly be uh, an independent student. And that's an embarrassing kind of touchy subject for a student to ask in public. So we understand that and we'll answer those questions accordingly uh, for those in those situations. Now, you mentioned uh, federal work study uh, as part of the financial aid. Now, this is when you say work study, it's like we got Nick here who's a student at FGC and he he's working camera but he's also going to school mm -hmm. and he's but he's working a camera so he's getting some experience in the television world what other jobs are available for students that may qualify for federal work study so the federal work studies program is a work study it's a program that's uh, where there's actual federal funds designated to actually help pay this that money comes from the federal government um, as opposed to uh, the institution having to set up a budget for a student worker, th there's actually money that's set aside by the federal government that will pay students to work. And students are able to pick where they want to go in terms of working. They can pick a department or if a department has an opening here on campus and they qualify for federal work study, then they are more than welcome to apply. If the department decides that they, want, they will accept that student, they begin to work and they get a paycheck. The good thing about it is, is they don't necessarily have to set a schedule that would be or set a demanding schedule. So if today they're able to work and tomorrow they're not, uh, the, the department can't penalize them because they're not able to show up for work. It's a federal program and we like for students to take advantage of that. Well, um, and, and there are jobs like if you want to be on the grounds crew uh, and you want to uh, use a weed whacker or, you know, that's, that's a, a job. There's a mail room. Uh, mm -hmm. You can work in the mail room. We do still have mail out here yes, and you get delivered <laughs> uh, in our office memoranda goes through the, the mail system. So there are different types of jobs where students can get ex experience. I know we got people in the library right now that are Correct. helping to check books out. So and that's that's another important aspect is making sure that our students who are in um, the library counts as a community program and we have to spend a certain percentage of the budget to go towards these community programs. So uh, students that want to work in the library, but also a student who might want to work in the education system, who might want to work at an elementary school or a high school, uh, the schools probably consider it volunteer hours, but they'd actually get paid to go in and actually do work in the, at, at a school. And uh, we, they could draw down payment for that. Or um, the one I haven't run across a lot is, is these nonprofit like a, a church or like the Christian Service Center or, or anything like that. I haven't run across any students wanting to work in those areas, but because it is a community project, it is a community program, the students could qualify uh, under that as well. Now, the last thing you were talking about as far as financial aid is <coughs> concerned is the uh, low interest loans. Yes, sir. Um, and you say you kind of discourage that, even though it could be something that, that could help out. Yes, um, students qualify for loans as long as they're meeting the federal standard. Uh, the one thing to remember is that a loan, the federal loans follow the same guidelines as federal pay. So students still have to follow academics. They still have to make sure that they're, they have a 2.0 GPA. Completion rate is not below 67% and they're not max 150 in a program of study. So if they don't qualify for pay, they don't qualify for loans. Uh, now, the, there are three different types of loans that are federal loans. There's the subsidized, the unsubsidized, and the plus loan. The subsidized loan is a loan that the federal government pay, that the federal government pays the interest on while students are enrolled in school. Uh, so with that, when if a student borrows thirty five hundred dollars today, when they graduate, all they're owed is thirty five hundred dollars. With the unsubsidized loan, that loan does accrue interest while you're in school. So the interest rate right now is about four, a little over four percent, and so on that one, that one will accrue interest. 
um, as it can as a student continues to matriculate in the school and the uh, plus loan is a parent loan for undergraduate students that loan um, the only thing about the plus loan is the parent is responsible for that loan that loan has no cap it just can't go above the budget now with the other two loans I mentioned those have a cap of a certain amount based on the, uh, the students uh, dependency status and whether um, the year that they're in college but with the plus loan there are no um, uh, there are no regulations or, or restrictions on it other than it can't go above the budget. So you say that the loans have to be paid back once you graduate the, the, int the in plus interest? Correct. Um, with the federal loans, the good part about those are they have to be repaid six months after you graduate, six months after you cease to enroll half time, or six months after you cease to enroll. <clears throat> and even if a student goes to school here, let's say they take out a federal loan, and then they decide to go to another university. Once they get to that other university, they can do what's called an in-school deferment, which means that they don't have to make payments on that loan until after they actually graduate. And then even if they decide to go to grad school, they can do another in-school deferment and they don't have to make any payments on that loan as long as they're enrolled in school. The only thing is uh, with the subsidized loan, a student can possibly use, lose the subsidy on the loan uh, after a certain time after it has sat for a while, so that means that the subsidized loan will uh, actually eventually start to accrue interest, um, just like the unsub loan. But uh, the good thing about it is with the federal loans, if a student has to take out a federal loan and they run into a snag, the, uh, what the federal loans are designed to do are to help students, and most all the lenders will work with you. Right now, there are seven different ways to actually repay federal loans. Uh, we try to watch our default rate here, and all institutions try to, uh, but with the seven different ways to repay a federal loan, there should be no reason the student is, should be in debt because uh, loan services are always looking to work with their lenders. What, what, now, when, when you start doing the loans, how much of, of advice does the financial aid office give students? Uh, like, this is what it's going to cost you. You have to pay it back because there's sometimes there's you get caught you're right. not in school anymore right but you still have that loan well and that's that's also good that you say that because uh, the most important thing is is before a student can ever receive a federal loan they have to complete what's called entrance counseling and the entrance counseling actually does go through what a student will owe so you actually have to put in it's very interactive you have to answer all the questions uh, it is it, it takes a process but what they're doing is the federal government made that a mandate and it makes the student understand the responsibility of the loan. It goes through the terms and conditions of the loan and, and what do you need to do if you're having trouble repaying your loan? Because unlike a bank, with these federal loans, it's mandated by the federal government, therefore they're not as strenuous about, I gotta get my money back right now. It's more like we wanna work with you to help lower the debt that we're in as a country. And so, um, so the interest counseling does go over how much the interest rate will be on the loan. It'll tell them if, if they plan on graduating in two years, this is the amount that they'll owe, and this is what their monthly payments will be. The, the smallest amount that a student will pay back on a loan is $50 a month. You know, Travis, you, you talk about uh, having to teach students. High schools don't teach fi high finance. <laughs> I mean, and we had, a, we had a group of folks in here uh, with the greater CDC uh, and talking about your credit score messing up a potential loan for a new house uh, and right. so it's unfortunate that uh, as a country we don't we don't teach uh, right. how to have a good credit score and how to pay back loans and and uh, having a budget uh, right. and living by that budget yes. so I'm sure all that is discussed in, in uh, counseling before they are able to take out loans. Thank you for watching Perspective here on Florida Gateway College Television. Until next time, I'm Mike McKee. So long.